Hello. My name is Afa. I am uh, also known in Taiwan and China as Hui Yafeng. And um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to read these four poems to you that are part of this lovely, lovely anthology. And um, I um, would like to talk a little bit about my life as it relates to these poems. Um, thanking also now everyone on the staff at the Library of America, but also um, especially Kevin Young for his selection. Uh, Kevin um, probably knows a little bit about the Chinese context and influence in my life, but I think I should tell you more. So I'm in junior high school <laughs> and the movie uh, Goldfinger has been released and I'm in a special program. I'm skipping the eighth grade. So it is 1964, I'm 13 years old. And I see this character, Ah Job, he's just an amazing, he's a big burly guy, Harold Sakali was the actor's name. And he actually did not know any martial arts. He had this <laughs> incredible hat with a steel brim, which just caught my fascination. But then when I went to high school, um, there was a TV show, The Green Hornet. And there was a young man from Hong Kong who many people know now, or at least know his name. And uh, he played uh, Cato, the sidekick to the Green Hornet. And that was Bruce Lee, and I was mesmerized. And uh, it was 1966, and um, I grew up in Baltimore, you know, in, in East Baltimore, and it was a very difficult and very violent time in the country. And, and the neighborhood itself could be pretty dangerous at times. And I was a nerd, you know, a big guy, a nerd, and I'd always wanted to be athletic, but just very often I was just very afraid. And uh, I was one of those kids who was placed on a bus to go to a predominantly white school. That was the junior high school, and um, which was away from our neighborhood. And so was the high school, but uh, just, just a sense of fear all the time. And so the idea of being able to take care of myself was just very appealing. And um, so I, I, in the fall of 1968, I landed at the University of Maryland in College Park. And I was just 16 years old. My birthday's in November, so I was a few months away from my 17th birthday. And there I was, this big uh, teenage nerd. And... Um, I was in the School of Engineering, and uh, that's not really what I wanted to do. My creative spark had been uh, lit by a research paper I did on Frank Lloyd Wright in high school, and I thought I might be an architect, but I also had a very good teacher of Shakespeare. I just loved reading those plays and memorizing monologues. So the engineering didn't last very long. My freshman comp teacher recognized my writing ability that fall. I fell in love. And then in the spring of 1970, I dropped out and um, determined that I was a poet and I was going to study and my craft and live my life as a poet. And I had taken uh, two courses that really fascinated me that fall, that spring, the last spring there. That was 1970, a tragic time in Jackson State and Kent State when students were killed by soldiers and police. But um, the autobiography of Malcolm X framed my pathway for me. And uh, I was just, I just so heavily identified with him as being someone who studied what he thought was important to him and his development, but also had a transcendent life and found his way to a broader view of humanity. And that book um, remains somewhere in the center of my heart, and my spirit. And um, so I left the, the university and um, I was 18 years old and I had designed my happiness. Uh, we were, my, my wife to be and I, we uh, were engaged and expecting. And I got a job in the Bethlehem Steel Company and I also joined the Army Reserves. So I was one, I wanted to be a soldier. I had cousins who were in Vietnam and I wanted to be like them, you know, rough and tough, that kind of thing. It was you know, very insecure about my masculinity in those days. And uh, so we were married in December, and three days later, I was shipped off to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. 
I was trained as a winter soldier. It was 40 below with the wind chill factor out there at times. And the child was born while I was in basic. Uh, the following January, the child passed away at 10 months of age. And in January of 1973, um, I had accumulated all the ingredients of what's known in the field of mental health as complex PTSD or CPTSD with three major components, um, child trauma of which I was largely unaware at the time, but it was, uh, the evidence was there. The social trauma of growing up in the 1960s when Dr. King was killed in 1968, there were race riots in over about a hundred cities. It was just difficult time. And then the military was, it was like a three-stage rocket. And so in January of 1973, I collapsed. You know, we had a second child who was doing well. He was alive and well, but the weight of all that, I just collapsed. And um, I thought things were over for me. And um, I had left uh, the steel mill and gone to Procter & Gamble. And one day, a coworker in 1973, I was 21, handed me a copy of the Tao Te Ching, uh, translated by Jia Fu Feng, with photographs by his wife, Jane English. And that was the beginning of my transformation and my healing process. And uh, I, cont I was actually studying and writing. I spent one semester at Morgan State in Baltimore in English, and Lucille Clifton came into my life. In the five years between 73 and 78, I wrote and I struggled, I, but the PTSD would just knock me down back and forth. And I was struggling for stability. In 1978, I discovered Tai Chi and again, I was mesmerized. But also in 1973, popular culture influenced me again. David Carradine took a role that was intended, that Bruce Lee actually created in a TV series, Kung Fu. And of course, his martial arts was nowhere near as impressive as Bruce Lee, but I wanted to be one of the monks, you know? I wanted to be wise, I wanted serenity. And when I heard in one of the first few episodes of the show, one of the monks reciting the Tao Te Ching, I had this kind of affirmation. But I started studying uh, Tai Chi, uh, and I went through three teachers. A third teacher became my first long-term teacher in a system called Tenshin Pai, and originating in Western China. And um, I, you know, I was certain, I was absolutely certain that I could start to be stable, more stable and be more productive. And so I placed my faith in Tai Chi and uh, it did not disappoint me. But in the spring of 1979, my family, um, wanted me to continue with a family-based therapy program at the University of Maryland Hospital. And um, I had another of those panic attacks that came, um, not coincidentally, around the same time that I did my basic training. And it were just these extreme panic attacks um, with flashbacks to the military training, et cetera. And I found myself in the emergency room trying to negotiate with them and explain that this thing which they thought was absolutely strange, was going to bring me stability and, and a productive way of life. And so 20 some years later, I was teaching at Kabe Kam in 1997. I wrote this poem entitled Inside the Blues Well. And Inside the Blues Well goes back to that event when I established this with my family, negotiating with my family of origin my own way to a more stable and productive life. And it's entitled, Inside the Blues Whale. 1978 to 79 for Vincent Woodard. It is not just my problem. It belongs to us all. I have been cajoled into coming to the emergency room where everything scares me. Black folks shoot and cut each other until they end here where guards have guns. I refused to be taken upstairs and locked away. I was trying to think of a poem. 
It got me to this place. With my mother, I stand against the wall, guards on either side. They have guns, and this is my mother. It is now everybody's problem. A bird is singing in my hair, more important than Thorazine. My head is a tree stretching its leaves to burn in the sun. They say if I make a treaty to take the medicine, I can leave with my family since my family is crazy. I look at the guns on the hips of the guards and know I must be as still and quiet as death, or this will turn into psychosis as sick as nightmares. I am angry that they would have me here with my mother, angry at white doctors. I am in a whale in the ocean. Who can swim out to me? Who can cast a line? If I take out the first guard by breaking his neck, I can protect my mother. But it is more important that we are all now underwater inside a whale who laughs. Later, the therapist they say likes me keeps talking about the appointment. She is doing something subliminal with the word come, repeating, repeating. She leans to me when she says it. It bothers me that such people think crazy people are stupid, but it is more important that my head is a tree with a bird singing in it, inside a whale in the ocean. The most important thing of all is that this whale that ate us likes to laugh a lot. He has the blues. So, I did become more productive. I started a small press. I did some work as a freelance journalist. I wrote and published poetry for the next uh, six years and uh, emerged from life as a factory worker. And my time, those 15 years, that was my literary apprenticeship. And I received an NEA and the rest, I think is well, a story that's known at least among some. And um, in uh, 1998, I, I came into a more conscious awareness of um, the child abuse um, that was at the root of my complex PTSD and uh, compounded by the turmoil in my adolescence and the military training. And um, the, uh, the effect of that was that I stopped writing regularly for a number of years and did other things. I got a Fulbright to teach in Taiwan and I was still doing Tai Chi and um, came back and started studying Mandarin and uh, working with poets in uh, Taiwan and China and Hong Kong in two conferences I convened and so on. Just not really thinking I would do much with poetry anymore, but I lived in Taiwan for about nine months from November of 2004 into 2005. This summer was my sabbatical from Simmons in Boston where I lived for 20 years. And um, I spent some time in a monastery that spring. And the uh, director at the time was now a full-fledged monk, Dr. Yu Shi, also wrote. And he encouraged me to get back to my poetry. And um, by this time, I had an understanding of how the child trauma had affected all of my work. It was, the evidence was everywhere. So the first book I did was um, the, uh, the Plum Flower Dance. And I did two others, which I call the Plum Flower Trilogy. Uh, the two poems here, Scrapple and Washing the Car with My Father, are from the middle book, The Government of Nature, which earned me the Kingsley Tufts in uh, 2014, I believe. <laughs> Forget the year a little bit. But um, they go directly into the trauma. And it was difficult. You know, I love my family very much. and. Um, just did not want to have to deal with the story of my favorite uncle. It hurt so much. Um, but here we are, Scrapple. It was cousin Alvin who stole the liquor, slipped down Aunt Maybe's steps on the ice, fresh from jail for some small crime. Alvin liked to make us laugh while he took the liquor or other things we did not see. 
and Aunt Maybe's with her floors polished, wood she polished on her hands and knees until they were truth itself and slippery enough to trick you. Aunt Maybe, who loved her Calvert extra and loved the bright inside of family, the way we come connected to, to webs born in clusters of promises, dotted with spots that mark our place in the karma of good times. Good times and the long ribbon of being colored. I learned when colored had just given way to Negro and Negro was leaving us because blackness chased it out of the house, made it slip on the ice, fall down and spill N-E-G-R-O all over the sidewalk until we were proud in a new avenue of pride. As thick as a scrapple on Saturday morning with King Serp, and the good times between the strikes and layoffs at the mills when work was too slack and Pop sat around pretending not to worry, not to let the stream of sweat he wiped from his head be anything except the natural way of things, keeping his habits, the paper in his chair by the window, the radio with the Orioles, with Earl Weaver the Screamer, and Frank Robinson the gentle black man, keeping his habits, mama keeping hers the WSID gospel in the mornings, dusting the encyclopedias she got from the A&P, collecting the secrets of neighbors, holding marriages together, putting golden silence on children who took the wrong turns, broke the laws of getting up and getting down on your knees. These brittle things we call memories rise up like the aroma of scrapple, beauty and ugliness, life's mix where the hard and painful things from folk who know no boundaries live beside the bright eyes that look into each other searching their pupils for paths to prayer. In um, um, my book, uh, My Father's Geography, the Plumfile Trilogy is from the University of Pittsburgh Press, by the way, and Inside the Blues Wells from Sarah Band. And um, in My Father's Geography, there are a number of poems about this favorite uncle and my poetry was gradually unfolding my life to me, my early life. And uh, as I got older, I came to realize that. And it was very difficult to tell my father. And I didn't want to do it because he had had a stroke and I was just really concerned. But I thought that he should know. And uh, so in my imagination, this conversation is around the car that he had in 1962. It was a Chevrolet Bel Air and a four-door sedan with no air conditioning. And it was the family car that I took out recklessly driving when I was a teenager. But I resurrected that car to frame the conversation that took many years later, took place many years later. Washing the car with my father. It is the Twilight Blue Chevrolet Four doors with no power but the engine, white wall tires, no padding on the dashboard. The car I drive on dates, park on dark lanes to ask for a kiss. Now my hand goes along the fender, wiping every spot. The suds in the bucket, my father standing at the gate, poor and proud, tall and stout, a wise man. A man troubled by a sun gone missing in the head, drag racing his only car at night, traveling with hoodlums to leave the books for street life, naming mentors, the men who pack guns and knives, a son gone missing from all the biblical truth, ten talents, prophecies, burning bushes, dirty cars washed on Saturday morning. He tells me not to miss a spot, to open the hood when I'm done so he can check the all the vital thing like blood blood of kinship, blood spilled in the streets of Baltimore, blood oozing from the soul of a son walking prodigal paths leading to gutters. Years later, I tell him the stories of what his brother-in-law did to me, and he wipes a tear from the corner of his eye, wraps it in a white handkerchief for church, 
walks up the stairs with the aluminum crutch to scream at the feet of black Jesus. And in these brittle years of his old age, we grow deeper, talk way after midnight, peeping over the rail of his hospital bed as we wash the twilight blue Chevrolet. So that was, um, those two poems are from the uh, Government of Nature, the middle book in the um, Plum Flower Trilogy. The first one is the Plum Flower Dance, then there's the Government of Nature. And the third one, the third book in the trilogy is City of Eternal Spring. And um, all from University of Pittsburgh Press. And my most recent book from Pittsburgh is Spirit Boxing, which contains this last poem. And um, Spirit boxing is woven around a, um, an, a, 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 well, a belief, I should say, or an idea. Some people don't quite believe it, but it is that at the higher levels of Tai Chi, your intuitive sense takes over and you move according to your connection in a Taoist sense with everything around you and uh, in this world and the world beyond nature. You're just totally in tune with everything and um, you move according to the spirit. And um, I call it spirit boxing. It's also designed and woven around the, um, the bagua, which is the um, circle of, uh, of trigrams that make up the I Ching, which you'll find in Chinese gift shops. And it's also um, an emblem for the Wu-Tang Clan. And uh, the uh, last poem in this book is dedicated to Riza. And I hope you uh, will get note of that. But um, so this poem, John Henry Sleeping in High Grass, imagines John Henry as we know him according to folklore, but also as a Tai Chi master and a, a kind of um, a teaching spirit for African-American culture. And uh, this book's Spirit Boxing, which contains this poem, is a return also to my first book, Water Song, which is was in 1985 when I left the factory, published by Charles Rao and his Callaloo series. And I thank Charles for that. And this book is a return to that water song and the spirit boxing. John Henry, Sleeping in High Grass. Mowers miles away, mud flies on top his hammer like they own it, his chest cresting and falling in shapes shifting between sunlight and leaves, black steel his destiny. John is motion at rest, tides of moon and waves and still waters, suns igniting hearts of molten iron, a hardened conviction, rose petals in rain. Sleep is a dream, the real world a poundage, work a sentence for being his mama's son, the hammer in his crib, the supernatural, a drum song of woodpeckers, cowbells in the field, heaven a home going back to a place before the bugle call to be born. John Henry, Sleeping in High Grass, an American Sonnet. And in closing, I should want to thank everyone at the Library of America again, and also uh, acknowledge the importance of Cave Canon. I was um, the fir well, first faculty along with Elizabeth Alexander, but Elizabeth and I were also the guest poets in 1996. And in 98, I was named the first elder of Cave Canna. Also in 2005, I received the Gold Friendship Medal in Beijing, Beijing Writers Association. And uh, last year in Taiwan, I was given the 96th Medal of the Writers and Artists Association of Taiwan, which is a national uh, distinction in Taiwan. So just to come back to my uh, China Chinese influence in my life. And um, my papers are held in the archives of Boston University, Howard Gottlieb Archival Research Center, if you'd like to know more about any or more of this. So thanks again to all of you, and I hope those of you who are watching this enjoy my stories as well as the poetry. Uh, thanks again. Bye-bye. Or in Chinese, 再见. <laughs>